This is Dr. Eric Osansky, and in this video, I'll be discussing seven blood tests those with autoimmune conditions should consider getting. I'll also show actual lab reports for each test, and I will discuss both the lab and optimal reference ranges. Before I begin, I just want to remind you that the main reason I put together these videos is to help people with different types of autoimmune conditions and other health issues better understand their test results so that they can find and remove their triggers, correct any underlying imbalances, and feel great again. I need to let you know that this video is not meant to be used as medical advice or as a recommended treatment protocol, and it isn't a replacement for consulting with a competent healthcare practitioner. Different autoimmune conditions involve different autoantibodies. For example, thyroid peroxidase and thyroid globulin antibodies are associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. While autoantibodies are typically used for diagnosing a specific autoimmune condition, and although I do recommend testing and retesting autoantibodies in my patients, I'm not listing them as one of the seven blood tests in this video, as I really want to focus on markers that go beyond diagnosing autoimmunity. So with that being said, the first blood test I'd like to discuss is a complete blood count, also known as a CBC with differential. Be on the lookout for another video where I'll discuss this test in greater detail. So a CBC evaluates the cells in a bloodstream, and it looks at three main types of cells, which include white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. To the right of each marker is the value, and to the far right you can see the reference range of each marker. Just a reminder that while you of course want to see all of these values fall within the laboratory reference range, there is also a functional reference range, also known as the optimal reference range. So let's talk more about optimal reference ranges. You need to keep a few things in mind regarding the reference ranges. First, different labs use different reference ranges, and some labs also use different units of measurement. For example, for the 25-hydroxy vitamin D test, in the United States, they typically use nanograms per milliliter, whereas in many other countries, they use nanomoles per liter. Second, there is also an optimal range for each lab marker, and I'm going to list some of the optimal reference ranges during this presentation. Keep in mind that not every practitioner will agree on the same exact optimal ranges, but it should make sense that in most cases, you don't want the lab values to be too low or too high. You already saw the report with the lab ranges for the CBC, and I'd like to give the optimal reference ranges for the white blood cell, red blood cell, and platelets. And so let's take a look at them. So an example of a white blood cell lab reference range, again, this will vary depending on the lab, but in this case, it's 4.5 to 10.5. The white blood cell optimal range would be 5 to 8.5. And then we see here the red blood cell lab range, again, an average range would be 3.8 to 5.6, whereas uh, the red blood cell optimal range would be 4.2 to 5.0. Platelets lab reference range, an example here is 140 to 415, whereas the platelets optimal range is 180 to 380. So let's quickly summarize the CBC with differential. A CBC evaluates the cells in the bloodstream. It looks at three main types of cells, which includes white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Imbalances in these cells can be an indication of anemia, inflammation, and infection, and even cancer. Infections are a potential trigger of autoimmunity, and while a CBC with differential won't specifically identify infections, it can give you an idea if you have a bacterial, viral, or parasitic infection. The truth is that everyone should get a CBC with differential on an annual basis and not just those people with autoimmune conditions. The good news is that most health insurances will cover this test and even when they don't, the out-of-pocket expense is low. Blood test number two is a comprehensive metabolic panel. Like a CBC with differential, a comprehensive metabolic panel can provide a lot of valuable information which is why it's routinely done by healthcare practitioners. Here you can see a sample comprehensive metabolic panel. You can see that it looks at glucose, which you ideally want to do fasting. It also looks at some kidney markers, a few electrolytes, proteins, and markers related to the liver. Once again, while you don't want any of the markers to be outside of the lab reference range, there are also optimal reference ranges to pay attention to. I won't list them all, but here are some of the more important optimal ranges, and I'll compare them with the lab reference ranges. So an average potassium lab reference range would be 3.5 to 5.2. Uh, 
and for potassium an optimal range would be 4 to 4.5 for calcium an average lab range would be 8.7 to 10.3 whereas uh, an optimal range for calcium would be 9 to 10 for AST which is a liver marker uh, an average lab range would be 0 to 40 whereas an optimal range of AST would be 10 to 28 and then ALT is another liver enzyme and the lab range would be 0 to 32 whereas the optimal range would be 10 to 28. So let's give a brief summary of the comprehensive metabolic panel. This panel can help to evaluate the health of your liver and kidneys. It looks at the electrolytes along with the blood glucose and the blood proteins. The third marker that everyone with an autoimmune condition should consider getting is the 25-hydroxy vitamin D test. I'll show an actual example in a minute or two, but let's first briefly talk about the importance of vitamin D. Many people are aware of the importance of healthy vitamin D levels with regards to bone health, but vitamin D has many other important functions. In fact, just about every tissue and cell in your body has vitamin D receptors. Although vitamin D is referred to as a vitamin, the active form is actually a pro-hormone. Numerous studies show that vitamin D plays an important role in modulating the immune system and inflammation by decreasing pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are a factor in autoimmunity. So while it's important for everyone to have healthy vitamin D levels, it arguably is even more critical for those who have one or more autoimmune conditions. 25-hydroxy vitamin D is the marker that should be tested through the blood. Some healthcare practitioners will test 125-dihydroxy vitamin D and when you consider that this is the active form of vitamin D, this might make sense. However, it's important to understand that 125-dihydroxy vitamin D is regulated by parathyroid hormone, and when someone has a vitamin D deficiency, this results in a compensatory increase in the parathyroid hormone levels, and this in turn will increase 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. And so 125-dihydroxy vitamin D is usually normal or elevated in the presence of a vitamin D deficiency. A common laboratory reference range is 30 to 100 nanograms per milliliter, but the optimal range is 50 to 80, and some will suggest that the level should be over 60 for optimal immune system health. Ideally, sunlight exposure is the best way to increase vitamin D levels, although many people do need to supplement with vitamin D3. If doing this, it's also a good idea to take vitamin K2, which helps to guide calcium into the bone. Overall, it is very difficult to get enough vitamin D from the diet. Here you can see 25-hydroxy vitamin D on a report, and as I mentioned, many labs use a range of 30 to 100 nanograms per milliliter, but you want the levels to be above 50 nanograms per milliliter, and some suggest over 60 for optimal immune system health. The fourth marker that should be tested by those with autoimmune conditions is HSCRP, which is high-sensitivity C-reactive protein. High sensitivity C-reactive protein is one of the main inflammatory markers commonly tested for, and it increases as what's called interleukin-6 or IL-6 is secreted by immune system cells. What is interleukin-6? Interleukin-6 is a protein that is a marker of inflammation. So CRP is not a specific test. Thus, if it is positive, it means you have inflammation, but it won't tell you where the inflammation is located. It's also important to understand that while you want to pay attention to an elevated CRP, a negative CRP does not rule out inflammation. And here's a common laboratory reference range, although the optimal range is less than 1 mg per liter. And here you can see HSCRP on a report, and you can see that this person's value is clearly elevated. Like vitamin D, Thyroid hormone affects just about every cell and tissue in the body, and so even if someone doesn't have an autoimmune thyroid condition such as Graves' disease or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you really do want healthy thyroid hormone levels, which is why I have a thyroid panel listed as blood test number 5. So why should you do a thyroid panel? As I just mentioned, thyroid hormone affects just about every cell and tissue in the body. The markers included in a basic thyroid panel include thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH, free T4 as well as free T3. Some thyroid panels will include the total T3 and, and total T4 instead of or in addition to the free T3 and free T4, but I find the free thyroid hormones to be more valuable. Early I mentioned how I won't focus on the autoantibodies, but I'll still list the two most common thyroid antibodies here, which are antithyroid peroxidase and antithyroid globulin antibodies. There are other markers related to thyroid health such as reverse T3, 
but I'll create another video on thyroid blood tests that goes into greater detail. As for the optimal reference ranges, I'll list both the lab and optimal reference ranges for the TSH, free T4, and free T3. So we can see here that a common laboratory range for thyroid stimulating hormone is 0 0.450 to 4.5, whereas an optimal range would be between 1 and 2. For free T4, a common laboratory reference range is 0 0.82 to 1.77, and an optimal range for free T4 is 1.1 to 1.5. And for free T3, a common laboratory range is 2 to 4.4, whereas an optimal range for free T3 is 3 to 3.7. And here we see a basic thyroid panel, which includes the TSH, free T3, and free T4. Overall, these numbers look pretty good, as the TSH is 1.030, the free T3 is a little less than I like to see at 2.6, and the free T4 looks fine at 1.20. And here is another thyroid panel, which includes the thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulin antibodies. And you can see that both thyroid antibodies are elevated, as is the TSH. The sixth blood test I recommend is Epstein-Barr virus. So why should you consider testing for Epstein-Barr? Epstein-Barr virus is one of the most common viruses in humans. So Epstein-Barr virus is usually spread through bodily fluids, primarily through the saliva. And although many people with Epstein-Barr virus are asymptomatic, some of the symptoms associated with an Epstein-Barr virus infection include fatigue, fever, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes in the neck, a rash, and an enlarged spleen. Numerous studies have associated Epstein-Barr virus with autoimmunity, including systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, Chagrin syndrome, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and Graves' disease. Most people will test positive for Epstein-Barr, and the testing can be challenging to interpret. Here you see the four different Epstein-Barr virus markers. There is viral capsid antigen, or VCA, IgM, VCA, IgG, Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen, or EBNA, and Epstein-Barr early antigen. Most people will test positive for VCA, IgG, and EBNA, and in the past it was thought that Epstein-Barr virus was in an inactive state if VCA, IgM was negative and VCA, IgG was positive. However, it seems that this isn't always the case, and if someone has very high levels of VCA, IgG, and EBNA, IgG on a blood test, let's say greater than 100 units per milliliter, this can be an indication of Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. According to some practitioners, if VCA IgG, EBNA IgG, and early antigen IgG are all positive, regardless of what the values are, then this can indicate reactivation of the virus. Keep in mind that not all practitioners agree with this interpretation, as many won't recommend any treatment unless if the VCA IgM antibodies are positive, which rarely is the case. The seventh blood test marker you should consider testing is an omega-3 index. I can't say that I have all my patients do an omega-3 index, as I usually include it as an optional test, although anyone who doesn't eat fish or take fish oil supplements might want to consider doing this test. The reason for this is because healthy levels of omega-3 fatty acids have anti-inflammatory effects, and they are essential for optimal immune system health. I personally have ordered a full fatty acid profile on myself, and this is something you can consider as well. In the description below, I'll include a link to the lab I use for a full fatty acid profile, although you also have an option of just doing an omega-3 index alone. For the lab I use, the optimal reference range for the omega-3 index is 8% to 12%. So here's the sample omega-3 index. You'll see that in this case, the person's omega-3 index is close to 5%, which is well below the optimal or desirable range of 8 to 12%. Although I discussed seven blood tests to consider in this video, there of course are other blood tests some people will need. I commonly recommend an iron panel to my patients, consisting of serum iron, ferritin, total iron binding capacity and percent saturation, vitamin B12 or methylmalonic acid is another marker to consider, blood sugar imbalances can perpetuate the inflammatory component of autoimmunity, and thus markers such as hemoglobin A1c and fasting insulin can be valuable. RBC magnesium is another blood test to consider. And in addition to Epstein-Barr, there are other viruses which can trigger autoimmunity, including cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex. 
Celiac disease is an autoimmune condition, and doing a celiac panel is something to consider, especially if you already have another type of autoimmune condition. It's important to mention that if someone has been on a gluten-free diet for a while, this test won't be accurate. I'd love to hear what you thought of this presentation, and so please post a comment below. And to get the latest videos to help you better understand your test results, make sure you subscribe right now and click on the notification bell, and I'll catch you in the next video.